story goes that the wolves were decimating the farmers' sheep herds. And so the Farmers Association decided that they would offer $100 for every wolf pelt. Well, Sam and Ed weren't very bright, and they also weren't very rich, but they decided they would go out there and see if they could make some money getting those wolf pelts. So they went out for the hunt, and they fell asleep under the starry sky, and then suddenly Ed woke up, and in the firelight he saw a hundred pairs of wolf eyes staring at them, teeth bared, low guttural growls coming from their throats. They were entirely surrounded by wolves. Ed, in a hoarse voice, said, Sam, Sam, wake up. We're rich! I told you they weren't very bright. When it comes to talking about the second coming of Jesus, sometimes I think we're in the position of Sam and Ed. I mean, the end of the world is not a laughing matter. It's terrifying when you think about it. And some people think about it as being quite frightening. And yet there's others like Ed who are excited about it. What are we supposed to think and feel about Jesus coming again. We come to that part in our series on the Apostles' Creed, Chord Strengthening, when we reach the line that says, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. When I came to Princeton Seminary almost, believe it or not, 40 years ago, I discovered that the campus is divided by a very busy road, Mercer Street. Cars race up and down all the time. On the one side of Mercer Street are the campus classroom buildings and the dining hall. You can see in this picture ahead of you, but behind you is the library. And that means that you'd have to cross over this very busy street if you want to go to the library or to campus classrooms and so forth. And at the time, 40 years ago, there was no light. There was no crosswalk. There was no way to get across. You just had to run fast. You had to duck. You had to dodge. You had to dive. You had to avoid these cars racing up and down Mercer Street. And so appropriately, after a while, the theological students came up with a name for this spot. They called it the quick and the dead. Because if you weren't quick, you'd be right. I guess you guys have a theology degree too, huh? What does it mean when we talk about the quick and the dead? What the word quick means is the living. So when it says that Jesus is coming back to judge the quick and the dead, it's the living and the dead. In other words, all people, those who are still alive and those who have passed away. In other words, he's judging all people of all times and all places and all ages. Now, when it comes to talking about the second coming, I see two opposing views. First one is intense speculation. People want to know, when is it going to be? When is Jesus coming back? And how is he coming back? Now, this is nothing new. Uh, In the 19th century, there's a man named William Miller. He was a Baptist preacher. He became, eventually, one of the founders of the second... Uh, the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, in, in the 19th century, he predicted that Jesus would return between 1842 and 1843. And many of his followers, at the time they were called the Millerites, went out and believed this was going to happen. And when that day came and passed, there was a lot of disappointment, a lot of people left the faith. And so he went back, he looked in the Bible again, and then he predicted again that Jesus would return in October 1844. Many people got excited about this. 200 people fled the city of Philadelphia like Lot running away from Sodom and Gomorrah. Shopkeepers closed their shops. Farmers left the crops out in the field. Everyone was getting ready. These days came. Jesus didn't. So what happened? They started to call this instead the Great Disappointment. It doesn't stop there. You may remember a couple years ago on I-95, there were billboards that said that Judgment Day would be on May 21st, 2011. This came from Harold Camping, a civil engineer and president of Family Christian Radio. 
he predicted, this wasn't his first prediction, but he predicted and then promoted the fact that on May 21st, 2011, the rapture would come. Jesus would pull all of his faithful followers out of the world on that day. Well, if you're hearing this sermon today, it didn't happen, unless we're the ones left behind. Actually, Harold Camping didn't get pulled out either, and so he went back and he looked again, and he decided that, no, he was wrong. It was going to be on October 21st, 2011, something about October 21st. And that day he came and went. All of these false predictions and 2,000 years of waiting have left people to go to the other extreme, and that is doubt and rejection of the idea that Jesus is ever coming again. One group that feels this way are communists. They don't believe in God or Jesus or the second coming, and their goal is to build instead of a heaven in, uh, of paradise in heaven, they want to build a paradise here on earth. And so they work very hard to try and create a worker's paradise. And they have very good intentions. But even Karl Marx, who, by the way, lived the same time as William Miller, Karl Marx said, repeated this quote, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. In other words, you have good intentions, you want to try hard, but the reality is every time humanity tries to build God's kingdom for him, disaster is the result. You have only to look at the Crusades, the kingdoms of the Caliphs, the Inquisition, Hitler's Reich, and Stalin's paradise here on earth to see the results of when we try to do God's work for him and create our own paradise. So we probably fall somewhere in between these two, somewhere between those who are desperately trying to figure out when Jesus is coming and some who say it's never going to happen. And the thing is, we're probably pretty much indifferent about it, because at least living here in Bucks County, life's pretty good. But that's not the way God views the world. He's not satisfied with the fact that millions face starvation and drug use and gun violence and warfare and refugee camps. That's not God's intention. For this world. And so we learn from the Bible that God is going to bring his kingdom. Jesus is coming back, whether we like it or not, actually whether we believe it or not. It says in the scriptures, over 300 references in the New Testament to the return of Jesus. That's one in every 30 verses in the New Testament. In fact, Nearly all the books in the New Testament discuss this subject. It's not a small matter in our faith. Jesus talked about it. The apostles talked about it. The creeds of the church talk about it. They don't say, if the Lord will come. They say, when the Lord returns. So, people ask, when will the Lord return? And here is my official, professional, theological, biblical opinion. I don't know. <laughs> but... I'm in good company because Paul didn't know. He says, now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, he's saying to the Thessalonians, we, do not want, we don't need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. In other words, unexpectedly. Jesus said, as we heard last week in the message, the scriptures we read, from Acts, it is not for you, disciples, to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. And to his disciples in Mark, he said, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So don't engage in fruitless speculation about calendars and dates and times. I think even William Miller learned this lesson after so many predictions. On his tombstone, it reads, at the appointed time, the end will come. Whatever it is, that's when it'll be. And by the way, Harold Camping, before he passed away, also gave up on all the predictions. So, why is it taking so long? This question actually was asked only decades after the resurrection. And the Apostle Peter responded to that question 
in his second letter. He says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So in other words, Peter is telling us that the 2,000 years we've just passed through are like two days to God. Our time and his time are not the same. He's giving us more time, though, in order to help more people come to faith and believe in Jesus and become part of his kingdom. So what is it that you and I should do if we're not going to be watching the clock? What he says is that we need to wake up and get in the game. We need to get busy at doing what Jesus told us to do. In 1987, LSU was in the NCAA regional basketball game playing against Indiana, and LSU had an eight-point lead over Indiana with only minutes left in the game. And so you could see LSU watching the clock, hoping it would run out and they would win. Unfortunately, during those last minutes, Indiana closed that eight-point gap and wound up winning by one point right at the end. Indiana eventually went on to win the NCAA championship that year. We need to stop watching the clock and wondering about when Jesus is going to come back and instead get our heads in the game doing what he's asking us to do. So how do you get in the game? Well, the first thing is to be ready. Be ready. Wake up and walk in the light, Paul says. Get ready. Be ready. You, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. You see, some people's lives are ruled by the thoughts and worries in their minds. And some people's lives are ruled by the desires and the passions in their bodies. And some people's lives are ruled by the demands and the temptations in the world. All these things can put out these drugs which put you to sleep with fantasies and false promises. What Paul says is wake up from all this. Take your mind, your heart, your body, and place them in God's hands. Let him guide, rule, lead you through this life into his reality. So he wants us to wake up our spirits. He wants us to be alert. How do you do that? You keep yourself tuned to God through prayer and through reading his word and through worship. And keep short accounts with God and others. This is why, as we just prayed a few minutes ago in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts, God. Let's clear the air. And help us also to clear the air with everyone else by forgiving our debtors, asking and receiving and giving forgiveness. Have a life that is cleansed and ready for Jesus to come. You know, my wife and I, before we go away on vacation, we always make sure to pay all the bills and clean the house and get everything nice so that it looks really good, I don't know, in case thieves break in, you know, <laughs> want it to look nice for them if they came in and so forth. Actually, seriously, why we do that is so that we have everything tied up, all no loose ends, and everything's in good shape so we can go away. Jesus is coming. Is life, the house of your life, cleansed and ready to receive him? A good way to do that is just to Keep short accounts. Don't let sin settle. Don't let resentment rule. Just ask God to cleanse and fill you and make you ready for his coming. Be ready. Here's the second thing. Get set. Set your feet firmly on the rock of Jesus Christ. Believe in him as the foundation of your life. Paul says this. He says, put on faith and love as a breastplate. That's like protecting your heart. And the hope of salvation as a helmet, protecting your mind, filled with hope. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, 
but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul talks about two potentially scary images in these passages in 1 Thessalonians. He first describes Jesus like a thief in the night. That would be a scary thing to have someone break into your house in the middle of the night. And if you are not awake and believing in Jesus, when he comes again, you might be afraid of him, terrified of when he's coming, like he's a thief breaking into your house. But if you believe in Jesus Christ and you look forward to his coming, when he arrives, he won't be like a thief breaking in. What he'll be instead is like your mom or dad coming home from a long business trip. I remember when I was 10 years old, my dad was in Japan for three months on a business trip. 50 years later, I still remember the joy and celebration when he walked through the door at the end of the trip that night. The Lord's coming for us. And if we are set firmly in our faith and hope and love in him, we look forward to his coming again. But the other image that is given is a judge on the bench. And it can be scary if you go before someone and know your life is in their hands and their decision. But this judge, if you believe, when you look in his eyes, you'll see pardon and grace and love. You realize that the hand that wields the gavel is pierced for you. And the feet at which you bow bear the marks of his love and forgiveness for you. This is why Jesus says to his followers, don't be afraid, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He wants to give you his kingdom. So ready, set, and go. Go into the world. Go into the world and teach his word. Make disciples. Confront evil. Challenge injustice. Share the good news. He did not tell us to go and judge. It's not our job to judge who's going to be saved and who's not. That's his job. It is our calling, his command, that we should make disciples, bring people into his kingdom, share this good news with them. It was also his command that we should care for the poor, feed the hungry, clothe the ill-clad, that we should heal the sick, visit those in prison, and help people find the hope of Jesus Christ. And so this is why I want to encourage you, invite people. The simplest thing is to invite them to worship, to your growth group, to mission. Just invite them. Get into a regular rhythm and practice of inviting people to get to know the Savior who's coming someday and who loves them and gave his life for them. But don't stop there. Also, Pray for the people who are going to the Dominican Republic mission trip this coming week. Pray that God will be with them, that the work that they do and the partners they work alongside will be able to bring forward some great works for the kingdom of God and help people find the hope Jesus wants to give. Don't stop there. Also, go over to Trenton. Help with the task, Trenton Area Soup Kitchen or Urban Promise. Or you can help homeless families right here with Family Promise. You can grab that QR code on the handout you received and sign up for the Faith Build, which is going to be on June 9th and 10th. We've already got people signing up for this. It was a great event. We're going to do it right here in our parking lot and bring people who need a house the hope of having that house. And I want to invite you to join me in helping out a school that we visited in Lusaka, the capital of Zambia, the Mandevu Christian School. It's run by a church there. 150 students come into this block of classrooms. But you can see the metal roof on top of this building. Well, that metal roof leaks. And the leaks inside created devastated destruction in the floor. Worse potholes than you're going to find this spring in Pennsylvania. Every day, children have to learn in these conditions with desks that have been warped and broken by all the rain and flood. We want to help them fix that roof, fix that floor, restore these desks, and give them the hope of an education and learn the good news of Jesus Christ. You're going to be hearing more about this as well. These are all opportunities for us to go 
and help people start to feel and experience his kingdom now. And look forward to the day when he returns. And when he does, 1 Thessalonians said, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. Gregory Jeffries was a teacher at the West African Bible College. He was teaching about scripture. His students at the Bible College always asked the greatest questions. Well, one day, one of his students quoting this passage, said, Professor, what will Jesus shout? Gregory thought, I I don't know. He wanted to say, I don't know. But before he answered, in his mind, he recalled the beggars that he sees every day on his way to school. He saw how poverty was taking away the humanity and dignity of people all around. He saw the ravages that hunger were causing and warfare. He he remembered a high school principal who was captured by a two-man death squad, and for hours they told him how they were going to persecute him and terrorize him. Thankfully, that man escaped. He found his family, and he took them to another country to get away from the Liberian Civil War. But sadly, that escape cost him dearly. He lost the lives of two of his children as they were trying to get away. All these things were swirling through Gregory's mind when suddenly the student said, Reverend Professor, you haven't answered the question, what is Jesus going to shout when he comes again? And suddenly Gregory felt from within him coming forth one word, one word that he would shout. He would shout, enough! What? The students asked. That's what Jesus will shout. He will shout enough of hunger and enough of poverty and enough of racism and enough of death and disease and destruction, enough of sickness and all of this hell on earth, enough. That's Jesus' wake-up call. Friends, have you had enough? Are you ready? Are you set? Will you go? Let us pray. Lord, this world is not our home, and it is certainly not the way you want it. But while we wait, help us to wake to what you want us to do. Lord, Let us be ready for when you return, set upon your truth, and going to do your work. We pray this, Jesus, in your name.